Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session on caring for LGBT people. Um, my name is Kathleen Caper. I'm the Head of Policy and Advocacy at Hospice UK. Um, we have four brilliant speakers for you on this very important topic this afternoon. As a person who spends a lot of time talking to hospices and recently lots of discussions about what data we collect on the characteristics of patients, um, I've been saddened to see that in the 21st century, we still think it's wrong or inappropriate to ask people about such an important aspect of their lives and of who they are. Um, that we think we don't need to know about this or that it doesn't affect the clinical care that we provide for people. It can make our claim as a movement that we support people to be themselves um, at the end of life ring a little hollow. And that is why the work of our speakers is so vital. Hospice UK will soon publish Care Committed to Me, delivering high-quality personalised palliative care at end of life for gypsies, travellers, LGBT people and people experiencing homelessness, a resource for commissioners, service providers and health and care support staff. That is a title that does roll easily off the tongue. But it is a reminder for us that it is the responsibility of all of us to deliver great inclusive care. As the Care Quality Commission recently reported, LGBT people can sometimes experience poorer quality of care at the end of our lives because our needs are not fully understood or considered. With international reach and practical insights from the latest research, this session provides inspirational real-world examples of initi initiatives to develop personalised end-of-life care for LGBT people. Our first speaker today is Dr. Kimberly Aquaviva, a tenured professor at the George Washington University School of Nursing. Um, she also has a book that is available from the bookstall um, out in the main corridor. Dr. Aquaviva is joining us by Skype, which I'm 100% sure is going to work perfectly. Hello. Hello, Dr. Aquaviva, I've just introduced you. We have yeah. a room full of people who are looking forward to hearing you speak, and over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, and my apologies. Uh, the technology can always be a challenge when we're presenting halfway across the world. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. I wanted to start just by doing a quick two-minute overview of what it is we're talking about when we talk about working with LGBTQ populations. Um, when I use those letters, I'm using it to refer to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender non-conforming, queer and or questioning individuals. And different parts of the world, people use different assortment of letters, different ordering of letters. The important thing to recognize, though, is not that there's a correct way to list those letters, but rather that the letters represent represent a very, very diverse set of communities, and that is why there's such variation. LGBTQ populations, when we talk about those populations, we're talking about two things, really. We're talking about sex, gender, gender identity and expression as one thing, and sexual orientation as another. So when we talk about sex and gender, and we talk about trans populations, sex is when a baby is born uh, and the midwife or a nurse practitioner or physician holds the baby up, they say, congratulations, it's a boy or girl. And how do they make that determination? The determination is made by a quick visual assessment of the baby. Um, and so that's why we talk about sex assigned at birth as one of the questions to ask on intake. And then gender identity is someone's internal sense of maleness or femaleness. So that is gender identity. So sex assigned at birth and gender identity are two of the questions that I recommend that people ask on intake forms, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so essential elements of an organization providing LGBTQ inclusive hospice and palliative care at the very foundation is a non-discrimination statement that is specifically inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity. And that is true, not just for a statement about the patients you serve, but also your employees. I know in different parts of the world, there are different um, non-discrimination laws at the national level. It's important to come up with some way uh, within your program, your hospice, to express publicly your commitment to not discriminating against LGBTQ people. 
And the reason why this is so important is LGBTQ patients and families are looking for some indication that your program is going to be welcoming of them as they seek you out. And they also want some reassurance. When you think about LGBTQ individuals who are seeking hospice care, there's a lot of fear there and fear that uh, if care is being provided in the home, that they will be outed um, or their identity as an LGBTQ person might end up being shared beyond that home. Um, there are concerns that the individual may um, not get the same treatment that someone who isn't LGBTQ would. And so anything that you can do to help make it clear that someone will be treated fairly is really important. The other thing is uh, in terms of the training for employees, every staff member in your hospice should have training on understanding about um, LGBTQ populations and how to be welcoming, affirming, and inclusive. And so that includes making sure that the people who are providing baths, um, your home health aides, your um, nurses assistants, making sure that they've been educated about working with trans populations, that they understand um, sex and gender identity, that they understand um, the importance of affirming and recognizing someone's pronouns. Because what happens when hospice care is being provided, it's incredibly intimate care whether it's physically intimate in terms of bathing or just emotionally intimate in terms of the conversations that are happening between patients, families, and the staff of the hospice. And so it's important to make sure that every staff member understands how to engage in those conversations in a way that's appropriate. So if a patient presents to them um, and they are, by all appearances, outwardly, they look like a male, but they identify as female and they use a female name. Um, so let's say it's someone who appears to, if someone were to just look, they think, oh, that's a man, but the person's name is Susan and they identify as female. It's important for staff to have the training to avoid having a shocked expression or avoid asking awkward questions. It's only through training that we can help our staff do a great job anticipating these situations. In terms of um, the paper and processes and people that are involved in interfacing with patients and families seeking hospice care, it's important to make sure that all three of those, the people, the paper, and the processes are welcoming and inclusive. And so that means that all of those crucial first points of contact, the person who answers the telephone, uh, the person who is at a reception desk at an inpatient facility, all of them need to have training and know how to be welcoming and how to answer questions. If someone calls your hospice and says, do you take care of LGBTQ patients or do, does your staff receive training? You want to make sure that that person answering the phone will know how to answer that. In terms of paper, um, when when I talk about paper, but no one really uses paper that much anymore unless you're a smaller hospice. So paper could be physical paper or an electronic health record. It's important to have questions in those intake questions that send a message to patients and families that you want to know who they are. Asking them, what sex were you assigned at birth? What gender do you identify as now? What pronouns do you use? What name do you want to be called? Who do you consider to be family? Who is important to you as family? These are essential questions to ask. And if we don't ask them, it sends a message to LGBTQ patients at the very beginning of our encounters with them that we're really not that interested in knowing who they are. And so they're incredibly important. The worst thing to do is asking what sex were you assigned at birth? What gender do you identify as now? Only if patients that you think look transgender. That is absolutely the wrong way to go about approaching asking those questions. In fact, here in the United States at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center, National Institutes of Health is our, our National Institute of Health. It is the biggest federally funded institute studying health um, in America. In their clinical center, every patient is asked on their clinical forms, the intake forms, what sex were you assigned at birth? What gender do you identify as now? because they recognize the importance of that information. And so I would urge you to be able to make those changes within your own hospice. 
thinking about marketing and community engagement, um, that is the smallest, I would say one of the smallest ways that you can connect with LGBTQ patients and families, but it's the area where people in some hospices tend to invest too much time and money. Um, they think marketing to LGBTQ people is really the answer. The answer to inclusive care, are all the other things I just talked about, and marketing and community engagement is the final piece. If you do a wonderful job of providing care, people will know that you do a great job providing care to LGBTQ patients and families. Um, it's important to engage with the community, uh, have community advisory boards that are inclusive of LGBTQ people. Look around at who's on staff at your hospice. Are there any LGBTQ people who are open about their identity who are in senior positions of leadership? If not, it gives you an opportunity as an organization to ask why not. It may, not, it may just be because no one has applied, but it could be reflective of some culture issues within your own hospice. So take a hard look at that. Do you know of people who are LGBTQ who work in your hospice, but who aren't public about the fact that they're LGBTQ? That may be an indicator also that um, there's some culture issues to look at in terms of how comfortable a place it is for people to be themselves. So these are really the core. That's the quick overview of how to make sure that you're providing inclusive care. I think the important thing to emphasize to staff is that you don't have to change your religious beliefs to provide inclusive care. I often ask audiences to raise their hand if they've been, um, if they grew up in a faith community. So even though I can't see any of you right now, I'm going to have you do this. Raise your hand if you grew up in a faith community or faith tradition of some kind. Now, Raise your hand if that faith tradition said that homosexuality is a sin. Okay, you can put your hands down. So it's okay if you think homosexuality is a sin. And I'll take it a step further and say, it is okay if you think that I, as a lesbian, am going to hell. And here is why I say that. How many of you are in a clinical discipline that has responsibility for the destination of a person's soul after death in your scope of practice. I'm guessing nobody. Um, and so this is why this is an important piece of information to understand. You can have your beliefs and still provide exceptional inclusive care because we're talking about your scope of practice as a clinician. Months ago, a nurse came up to me after a presentation and she said, I'm going to change the way I practice because of what you told me today. And I was really excited. And she said, I'm, I, she said, I still think you're going to hell, which was a little um, uncomfortable, but she said, but I'm going to stop telling my patients that. And I said, excuse me. She said, I'm going to stop telling my LGBTQ patients. I'm going to pray for their soul. That is a win. And so it's important that your staff understand no one wants them to change their beliefs. We want people to make sure their behaviors and interactions with patients are inclusive. So I think that's my 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to turn it over back to the moderator. And uh, thank you all so much for including me in today's conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Akuaviva, for that really enlightening talk. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Catherine Bristow. Catherine is the Herbert Dunhill Lecturer at the Cicely Saunders Institute of Palliative Care Policy and Rehabilitation at King's College London, um, also Director of the MSc in Palliative Care at KCL. She has co-led three studies focusing on improving care for LGBT people facing advanced illness and bereavement. Over to you. Thank you very much, and um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to be amongst such uh, illustrious company. It's great to be here. Um, so by way of a bit of um, background for me, I'm just going to... Can you see? I don't think I'm moving the slides here. Sorry. Can I have some technical help? I've still got Kimberly here. 
doesn't seem to... Oh, there we are. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Lovely. Thank you very much. So by way of a bit of background for me, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about why we're talking about the LGBT communities um, in, in regard to hospice care and palliative care in particular. Um, this work comes from a systematic review which really started the work that we've done at King's. What we know is that people who identify as LGBT uh, are at increased risk of certain life-limiting illnesses, so certain cancers, um, but also there's high rates of drinking, drug use, smoking, largely linked to the discrimination that's experienced. So there's potentially an increased need for palliative care amongst the LGBT communities, but there's also a lot of fear uh, of discrimination, and I think we need to take some responsibility for that as providers of care. Um, gay men in particular were excluded from hospice care from many of our great hospices uh, in the UK, amongst other places, uh, when they were dying of HIV and AIDS, and there's still a sense of exclusion from the communities. Um, and there's recognised inequalities in access to hospice care as well. Um, when we talk about the bereavement experience, when we, when we look specifically at bereavement in the LGBT communities, um, what we find is that, unsurprisingly, people who have lost a partner, lost the person they plan to spend the rest of their life with, experience pain, devastation, and that struggling to find out how you're even going to think about beginning to move on with your life. Um, but on top of that, what we found is that there's additional barriers and stresses. There's lack of recognition of the nature and depth of that relationship. There's lack of support from those around you. There's exclusion in and around the time of death, as well as additional legal barriers and concerns. What we found from doing this systematic review as well is that within the literature, there's very little that's looked at the outcomes in bereavement for LGBT people outside of that context of HIV and AIDS that I mentioned earlier. So there's been outcomes looked at in relation to taking on new relationships, sexual risk taking, but nothing about actually how do people get on in bereavement. So as a result of these two studies, we, we devised a model of bereavement um, for the LGBT communities. But this is really um, a model for disenfranchised groups in general. And what we found is that um, people's experiences in bereavement are shaped by the degree to which they feel comfortable to share that relationship with the people around them and the degree to which that relationship is recognised, uh, acknowledged and accepted. So whilst if somebody feels comfortable to share their relationship and is well supported by the healthcare staff, then they may uh, be able to access the care and support they need. Whereas if they don't feel comfortable to say, this is my significant other, this is the person that I'd plan to spend the rest of my life with, then they may not be recognised as uh, losing that primary relationship and may not be given the support they need in bereavement. So we chose to draw on these two reviews to undertake a primary research study, Access Care. We travelled around the UK asking people who identify as LGBT about their experiences of palliative care services and uh, bereavement. So I interviewed people who identified as LGBT themselves and were facing an illness, um, but also partners, significant others, chosen family, as well as bereaved partners. And this on screen gives you a bit of a sense of who we interviewed. And this is people's self-described identity um, on the top left. So we interviewed 40 people from across the UK. Half were describing an experience related to cancer, half related to non-cancer. And ages ranged from 27 to 94. In, in broad summary, what we found is that some people did describe some really positive experiences, feeling well supported, feeling that their relationships were recognised and acknowledged. But there were negative experiences. There were experiences of discrimination, lack of recognition of relationships, insensitivity. And we took these findings and put them into a bit of a model. And what this model is meant to display is that all people who identifies LGBT will have those holistic care needs that we talk about so much in palliative care, those physical, psychological, social, spiritual, or existential needs. Um, and their experience in healthcare will be positively and negatively affected by what is said to them by the professionals that are there, um, but also by what services are available to them. <coughs> 
But their experience will also be shaped by historical experiences. If you've been discriminated against in the past, you will carry that with you into that consultation. And receiving good quality palliative care is reliant on the knowledge, skills and attitudes of that professional that sat in front of you. So just to give you a bit of a sense of what these experiences actually look like, we asked everybody we spoke to whether they felt that their care needs were in some way different because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And Elaine puts this beautifully. Um, she says, no, her needs aren't any different. She says, um, we want what everybody wants. We want to be healthy, we want to be happy, we want to be content, we want to be comfortable, we want to be pain-free. We want all those things that a mammal, a feeling thing, wants. So from her perspective, there weren't any differences to the physical needs that she had. But when we talked to our trans participants, there were differences. Bridget was 68, living with COPD, um, and she'd been taking hormone therapies for many years and had developed blood clots in her lungs as a result of those hormones. And she'd been advised by her lung physician, you need to stop taking your hormone therapy. Um, now, these decisions to choose your physical health over your gender identity were unique to our trans participants. Another trans woman we interviewed talked about being refused gender reassignment uh, surgery because of her lung condition. So again, this having to make a decision of one health over another. But participants also described different psychosocial needs. So Rebecca was just 38 when she was bereaved of her partner, and she talked about the fact that society doesn't recognise and validate the loss of a civil partner in the same way that they'd recognise the loss of a husband. People just don't have the imagination to understand it's the same kind of relationship. But Nicola also talked about the extreme isolation she experienced in bereavement. She and her partner were in their 60s, had retired out to the countryside like many people do, moved away from a lot of their sources of support. And when Nicola's partner was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, died very quickly, Nicola was incredibly isolated. She said a lot of people assume that you are part of this huge LGBT community, you get given your membership card, and you've got immediate access to all these sources of support. She said, I was never part of an LGBT community, I was just a woman in love. She said, there's a slightly different dynamic between two women who've never considered having a family as it just wasn't done. So for her, this isolation was, was, was one of the biggest challenges. When we look at experiences from individual clinicians, um, I talked a little bit earlier about those, that negativity that people had described. So at the top, um, Fiona talks about those decisions about whether or not to disclose her identity. And interestingly, she talked about it as a risk assessment. She said, it's not about the person in front of me and them in particular, but it's a risk assessment around the whole situation. If I'm going to have a blood test, the phlebotomist doesn't need to know I'm gay, but if I'm going to see my GP because I just can't begin to get over the loss of my partner, then he needs to know who I am. James and Harry, just in their 20s and 30s, their civil partner, two adopted young children, a consultant kept referring to them as brothers. We'll talk more about this when your brother's back in the room, despite being corrected. Uh, this complete lack of recognition of their relationship. And Louise, who I mentioned earlier, one of our trans participants, talked about complete insensitivity around disclosure of her trans history. Uh, a doctor came in to see her in one of those um, magic soundproof curtained open bay booths. So she, um, the, the consultant came in and said to her, so how long have you been transgender for? And um, I think it was probably well-meaning. Um, he was trying to open discussions about gender identity, but he did it in front of an open bedded bay, six other patients. Louise had COPD, she'd become increasingly frail, she'd been attacked in the past, um, experienced violence, so she was very frightened, and with the increasing frailty of illness, um, she was always fearful about, about being outed in relation to her gender identity. We also asked everyone about the services. What could people do that would make you feel more included, more recognised, more respected? 
And there were many different experiences that people described. Edward talked about just not knowing what's out there. How can I ask about what services I need when I don't know what might be available to me? For Rebecca, it was vital that policies and uh, guidance was clearly inclusive of the LGBT communities. Alison talked about trying to find materials which for her, as a lesbian woman living with breast cancer, just didn't seem to make sense. There was a lot of focus on hair and makeup and nails and what she framed as a heterosexual view of attractiveness, which just wasn't part of her. And Tricia talked about looking for something beyond anti-discrimination. She wanted somewhere for her partner who was dying of early onset dementia. She wanted somewhere where she knew that her partner would be cared for and respected and that she would be welcomed when she came to visit. And she found a uh, care home that had the Olga logo on the back, the Older Lesbian Gay Association. And for her, that was all she needed as that marker of inclusivity. So drawing on all of these um, experiences, we developed 10 simple, low-cost recommendations. And these are part of one of our papers in palliative medicine, it's free to download. We wanted to develop things that were simple, low-cost things that you could do as an institution, both as individuals and with your institution as well. So recommendations around making sure your language is not asking about whether someone's married, but asking about who's important to them, all the great things that Kimberly talked about earlier. Being respectful of whether or not people want to disclose their identity and recognizing that. Being explicit in how you include partners and significant others. It can make such a difference. And as an institution, I know that Dallas will be talking a little bit more about this in a moment, but as an institution, making it clear that your policies are inclusive of the LGBT communities as well as other protected characteristics, but also thinking about ways that you can make your hospice more inclusive. Simple markers of inclusion, like a rainbow lanyard that says to that individual, I'm a safe place and so is this place. So the findings from this work have also been developed into a patient resource, so the yellow one there, which is free to download from our website, which is really about trying to help LGBT people to think about why they may want to talk about who's important to them, and also to, to give some recommendations about where to go if they feel the care they've received has not addressed their needs. And these are some of the other papers within this research stream. Just by way of uh, a bit of an update, um, I've now been fortunate enough, uh, fortunate enough to deliver this training to over 1,500 health and social care professionals across the UK. And we've also had um, talks at the UK Parliament and Welsh Parliament as well. So we're really delighted with how much we've been able to continue the momentum of access care. And that momentum has now um, rolled into two further studies. The first study was funded by Marie Curie. They've now funded our bereavement study, which is a population-based uh, post-bereavement study comparing outcomes in bereavement between those who've lost a same-gender partner and those who've lost an opposite-gender partner. We're just halfway through that study now, recruiting through the Office for National Statistics. And our second uh, follow-up study, Access Care C, funded by the NIHR. So this is about developing guidance one of the big things that always comes up when I present this work is, we know we do this badly, what could we do to be doing this better? What should I be asking? And so this follow-up study is really going to be about developing those, those really clear guidelines about how to ask about sexual orientation in the context of serious illness, but also how we can think about recording that information. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Catherine, and I know some of those resources are going to be incredibly useful for me as well in some of the projects that I'm leading. Now, needing almost no introduction, I'd like to... <laughs> I will introduce Dallas Pounds, Chief Executive of Royal Trinity Hospice in London. Dallas has led Royal Trinity to become the first hospice to be a Stonewall Diversity Champion and to march in London Pride, as well as spearheading the formation of the London Hospice's LGBT network. Dallas. Wow, that doesn't put me under any pressure at all, does it? 
So, I've still got a lovely picture of, of uh, Kim on, on the uh, screen here, but let's, let's see if that moves. Okay, super duper. Right. Okay, so, let me just tell you a little bit about Royal Trinity for those of you that don't know, just to set the scene, really. So, as it says up there, we're 127 years old. Um, we were formed in 1891 as the Hospital of God, Hostel of God, even, and occupy some of the same buildings today. Um, our catchment area is three quarters of a million people, and it's both sides of the River Thames, smack in the heart of the capital. We're a £13 million pound a year organisation, um, so we're old, <laughs> we're quite big, and we're in the heart of the capital. So here we go. So why did we need, as Trinity Hospice, to become more LGBT friendly? I became Chief Executive in 2013. And I know that when I turned up at Trinity, people were already saying, do you know our new CEO's gay? Do you know she's a lesbian? And there was almost a queue at the door when I arrived. I'm not sure whether they were expecting sort of dyke on a bike or, or what, but they got me. And some people seemed quite surprised by that, but hey-ho, that all goes back to how we identify ourselves, doesn't it? As a nurse by background, I knew that Trinity gave great care. I could feel it in the building, I could feel it in the staff. But what I came to realize really, really quickly was that we were shockingly poor at collecting data, any data, let alone gender identity and sexuality. And because we didn't have that data, we were not good at evidencing what we were doing or how well that we were doing it. How do you set about going across that problem. How do you set about taking a well-loved, well-meaning, fantastic hospice and putting some data on top? And not only putting data on top, but data that describes to the world what you're doing and that you value equality, diversity and inclusion. Because actually that was the problem for Trinity. It wasn't just about LGBT communities. It was about equality, diversity, inclusion across the board. Now I confess, as the new CEO and as a gay woman to boot, I chose to use LGBT as the launch platform for Trinity to look at ED and I. I hope you don't mind me uh, taking that down to ED and I. So I went round and I started to talk to colleagues. And as you've already heard, and you won't be surprised, I heard phrases like, we give patient-centered care here. We treat everybody the same. It doesn't matter to us if someone's gay. I'm sure we looked after someone who'd had a sex change. And some of that might sound okay on face value, but we aren't all the same, are we? And how can we give patient-centered care if we don't know that patient? As you've already heard from Kim and from Catherine, end-of-life care is complex, it's challenging. We all know that, everybody in this room knows that. It's a physical, emotional, spiritual and social experience. And if you then layer onto that the additional complexities and challenges that many LGBT people experience, it becomes even more interesting. So by this point, I was on a mission. So where did we start? Well, the first thing we did was find the evidence, or rather the lack of evidence. So because there was no data within Trinity, I went out to the wider world and I got evidence from my senior managers on the numbers of LG LGBT people within our catchment area. The number of LGBT people that we thought were accessing our services just by hearsay, really, and anecdotal evidence. I also spoke to them about all the things that Catherine's just said, about isolation, about the complexities of being an LGBT person in dying, the social aspects and the legal aspects. And slowly but surely, the senior team came on board with me. Now, that might just be because I was the new CEO and they felt like they had to, but, you know, I'm not one to, uh, to pass up a challenge. And we decided at that point that we needed to be very out about what we were doing and clear and public about our intentions. So we were the first hospice to sign up with Stonewall as a diversity champion. 
That costs money, and I'm not standing here advocating that every hospice should do that. But what it did for us as the first hospice, it gave us access to knowledge and um, experience and resources that we might not have got had we not been the first hospice. It also raised um, a lot of um, social interest and media interest in us, which we used to our advantage. But with our staff, we found a mix of hard facts about data and evidence needed to be mixed with some more informal and formal training. So sessions about use of language, um, use of pronouns, um, asking the right questions and how to ask those questions were really, really positive. But the thing that made the most impact was actually getting people in from the LGBT communities to speak to our staff about their experiences. And not just their experiences of end-of-life care, their experiences of health care in the round. The way they had been spoken to, the fear that they had had, lesbians being told they didn't need a cervical smear because they were lesbian, trans, excuse me, trans women being told that they didn't need prostate checks. All of these things, we got those people to come in and tell our staff the experiences. And I promise you, my staff sat there, mouth opened and agog at some of the stories that were happening in healthcare. We also established an LGBT friends group from our local community. We enticed them in with wine and nibbles, I admit that, but they came in and they talked to us about their experiences within end of life care. So whether, most of them were, were bereaved, but a couple of them were actively um, dying at that point. We asked them what they knew or rather didn't know about hospices and we asked them to give us some suggestions about our environment, to look at our literature for us, to look at our use of imagery, to look at the words that we were using, and also to give us some ideas about how we might reach out to the local LGBT communities. We liked ideas like thinking of an iconic LGBT film in our cinema series, but I did have to draw the line at the pink gin bar. We also had a program of inspirational speakers come into the hospice. All these people gave up their time for nothing, I should say. These were at lunchtime, and again, we enticed the staff to come with, with sandwiches and cake. No wine at this point. Um, and they weren't exclusively LGBT speakers. They were about equality, diversity, and inclusion in the round. But there were LGBT people amongst them. So we had young people talking about experiences. We had people from different faiths groups. And all of that just adds to the groundswell of awareness and questioning in your staff about their practices and their behaviours. So as a result of these, we did exactly what Catherine has suggested. We made some small environmental changes. We made sure that all our toilets were gender neutral wherever possible, and especially in all our public facing areas. We put small rainbow stickers on the main door to the hospice and on external notice boards. And we introduced rainbow pins for our staff, lan staff lanyards. They weren't mandated. Staff could come and ask if they wanted to wear a rainbow, and many do. And it was just these tiny, tiny cues. They're not in your face, they're not huge, but actually if you look for them, and as an LGBT person, if you are looking for them, they are there. And they shout, Trinity is an accessible and friendly place. We also wanted to be great with our LGBT staff and volunteers, of course. So we reviewed all of our policies for use of language, for use of pronouns, for use of um, jargon, for instance, and also making sure that LGBT, as well as the uh, other eight protected characteristics, were identified specifically within our policies. We also drafted a transitioning at work policy with a manager's guide against it. Many of you won't have a transitioning at work policy, but if you, if you want to uh, have a little look at ours, I'm very welcome to share. We were the first London hospice to march at London Pride in 2014, and we attracted a lot of positive attention. And it gave us the opportunity to get into the media, actually, and shout about hospice care, not just about Trinity, but about hospice care in general. And we grabbed that chance. And we were in things like Diva magazine and on um, Pink News and things like that. And it was really important for us that we could do that for the hospice world. We made links with our local LGBT forums and groups. And they've been really, really helpful in keeping the momentum going for us. And we have a good two-way relationship with them. They come into Trinity and hold their meetings. We have joint cinema series with them down at Clapham Picture House. 
And we also do joint educational activities. I was at the LGBT forum just a couple of weeks ago talking to their over 50s group about the complexities of talking about and planning for death and dying, especially as an LGBT person. We have 29 shops um, in Trinity, um, and we do things like have rainbow windows as Pride is coming up and a bit of a competition to see who can do the best window. We make sure there are also queues on our website and on our social media uh, at any point that we can as well. So what did we learn? We learned that in 2013, we absolutely could not have shown that we were accessible to LGBT communities. We recognised that we needed to change not only our language, but also our behaviours. I think we rather threw the kitchen sink at it, and that's probably my enthusiasm more than anything else. And in hindsight, probably I tried a bit too hard to bring about whole-scale change very, very quickly. And I thank my staff for putting up with me, actually, during that time. And although in my head I was using LGBT issues to highlight equality, diversity, inclusion in the round, I don't think I was clear enough that we were not seeking to become a gay hospice or develop specialist gay services. What we try, were trying to do was be accessible. But some of our biggest wins were from the smallest and the easiest actions, like the rainbow pins. We have had staff come out while they've been working at Trinity. They were previously not out about their sexuality or indeed their gender identity. And we have staff that have come out over the last few years. I cannot tell you how amazing that feels. And just the other week, we had an older, older gentleman come in for care. And one of our doctors was wearing a rainbow pin and he cried. And he said, how fantastic is it going to be that I can die as the real me? and it's okay for me to be gay. Tears to my eyes, even as an old lag like myself. <laughs> but the work we've done on LGBT people has definitely helped us address equality and diversity more broadly. And the work that we did just on LGBT um, gave us some external accreditation as well. And we're investors in diversity level one, just on the back of that work. And we're now going for uh, investors in level two. And I don't know whether any of you recognize Freddie, it's a new acronym, because we love to have new acronyms, don't we, all the time. And Freddie is Fairness, Respect, Equality, Diversity, Inclusion, Inclusion and Engagement. So look out for Freddie, because he's coming. <laughs> the other thing we learned is that word gets round. That when you do something that's a little bit different, when you're pushing the envelope a bit, people start to talk about it. And hence, people like me get given the opportunity to come and talk at events like this, and it's our pleasure to do so. But what we also learn from our LGBT communities is that it's a two-way street. And absolutely, there is an onus on us to be accessible, to make, those, um, to make those strides to let people know they're welcome and they can be who they want to be. But also, there's an onus on the LGBT community as well to try and trust us a little bit, to engage in conversations with us. And I've talked to my local LGBT community, and they recognize that, and they say, you know, Dallas, some of it's our problem. Some of it is because historic experiences of our friends live with us. We need to try and put those down, and we need to work with you. The fact you've opened your doors to talk to us will encourage us to meet you halfway, to make it a two-way street. Come on, move on. I hate technology. Hey. So that's just a bit about Trinity. So what's been happening since? Well, Pride has absolutely taken off. <laughs> um, so the top left, yes, left hand is a few of us from Trinity marching at Pride. And then if you move across to the right, you can see we became hospices across London. And the bottom on the yellow one is London Hospice's LGBT network. So we've gone from half a dozen at Trinity in 2014 to 100 marchers at London Pride. And I can't, it, if any of you have ever been to a Pride, you will know what the um, atmosphere is like. People were shouting for their individual hospices, they were shouting for hospices, the fact that we did such good work. Um, it was really, really humbling um, to be part of Pride.
completely positive. Some of you will recognise yourselves up there. I can spot faces in the crowd. Now, what happened because of Pride is that other hospices got interested in what Trinity was doing across London. And I had staff calling me saying, Dallas, I work at another London hospice, but I'd really like to come to Pride. Can I, can I come along and, and mar march at Pride? So I had a conversation with the other chief executives in London and said, you've got staff that want to march. How do you feel about that? And I'm really pleased to say there are 12 active London hospices now. And we have formed the London Hospices LGBT Network. And that is not just about making hospices accessible for LGBT patients. That's also looking after our LGBT staff and volunteers as well. And you can read for yourselves what our aims are. I won't uh, read them out for you. When you, we launched last October 2017. Um, at the moment, we've been really concentrating on gathering research, gathering evidence, and thinking about training across London hospices. And I know Claude is going to talk a bit more about training in a moment. But what we want to do as a network is provide a safe space, a space where staff and volunteers can come for advice, for support, um, for evidence of good practice, maybe just to offload but also to help hospices write good policies, have policies that are up to date, stay up to date with the changing jargon and acronyms because they do keep changing. Um, and that's it really, that's what we're doing. Um, and happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dallas. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Claude Chidiac. Claude is a lecturer in palliative care at St Francis Hospice and founder and course director of palliative and end of life care at London South Bank University. He has held a variety of clinical roles in acute hospice and community settings. Claude. Hello. Um, and thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I don't think I have anything to add after all this. No, I'm joking. I still have something to add. Um, that? Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about how and why we developed and evaluated um, uh, a training program for health and social care professionals providing palliative and end-of-life care for gender and sexual minorities. And just to say, this, is, this piece of work is, 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 is only one part of a wider project that is aimed at creating LGBT affirmative environment at St. Francis Hospice. So why is this relevant? And I'm sure, um, as my colleagues, my, the previous speakers you know, said, why is this relevant? Why did we do that? We know from a growing body of evidence that um, LGBT individuals face additional challenges when accessing health and social care services. And we know that they receive suboptimal care at the end of life. And this is mainly associated uh, with lack of knowledge and understanding about the specific needs and is issues of LGBT people amongst healthcare providers, and also because of homophobia, discrimination, and stigmatization. And this has been reflected in several recent national reports. For example, the Care Quality Commission in 2016, they did a thematic review into equalities in end-of-life care. And some of the main highlights uh, in that report were that um, healthcare providers and commissioners do not have a very good understanding of the different groups uh, within their communities. And the second thing was that um, healthcare providers and commissioners do not believe that sexual orientation and gender identity have any impact on accessing end-of-life care services. And the third highlight in that report was that um, providers, there's, there's very limited evidence that providers are engaging with the LGBT community and considering their specific needs. So that's why at St. Francis Hospice we felt that we need to do something about it. So um, how we do... How, how we developed and evaluated this project. Uh, just to say, this training program was not as simple as just to disseminate knowledge. It, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's about changing attitudes and beliefs um, in the hope that, as a prerequisite, and in the hope that this will ultimately help us introduce changes to create LGBT affirmative environment. So that's why we decided to adopt a change management model to help the development and implementation of that project. So we decided to go with 
Cotter's eight-step change model. So the first step in Cotter, in Cotter model is about creating an urgency. So Cotter argues that in order for a change to happen, we need to create a sense of urgency uh, about the need for this change. So as I mentioned earlier, the CQC report and other national international reports and evidence highlighted and identified a gap uh, and the need to for greater awareness of the disparities and the challenges faced by the LGBT community. And this is when we started informal discussion with uh, people in the field. And then the second phase is about forming a powerful coalition. In order for a change to happen, it's important and it's, it requires strong leadership and support from all stakeholders. So that's why we formed an interdisciplinary project steering group at the hospice that included also members of the executive team. And we also consulted with external experts and also, most importantly, members of the LGBT community to help us uh, develop this project. The third, uh, the third step is about creating a vision of change. The start of a plan for change usually involves so many great ideas, but the challenge is about how we can join these ideas in, in a coherent way to create a vision. Um, so initially, the, st the steering group decided to go, we decided as a steering group to go for a whole day training, and then we thought that maybe we need to go for half day. But um, at the end, we, we narrowed the feasibility of a brief 90-minute training program based on feedback from all stakeholders and, and in light of the current economic climate. We thought to have um, a greater impact, we needed to be short and brief so that more people could attend. And then we communicated this vision, this vision to education and training staff, to potential funders, and also to the wider community through social media and professional platforms. Um, in terms of removing obstacles, be, given, again, given the current economic climate and given the novelty and sensitivity of this topic, it was really important for us to be very flexible and open to feedback from all stakeholders. And another important thing that we, that, that, that was, you know, that was really important is to identify a go-to person, someone who has expertise in developing uh, culturally competent training programs for gender and sexual minorities to help at least at the initial phases. In terms of creating short-term wins, building on and anchoring the change, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, about how we are doing this now. So this ultimately resulted in us creating a, prog a, a training program, a brief one, that consisted of four main components. The first component was related to, the, to terminology and acronyms, and that included the different components of gender identity and sexuality. The second component included um, general issues and needs of, LG of LGBT individuals. And the third component was related to uh, LGBT issues and needs specific to palliative and end-of-life care, and the first component was related to approaches to developing an LGBT-friendly service. So this project was evaluated using pre-test, post-test design. So basically, we gave the participants a questionnaire that, and we asked questions related to their confidence and comfort and knowledge, level of knowledge, and also whether they thought that the program is useful for their training before and after they attended the training just to see the difference. So in terms of results, we, um, a total of 145 participants in five different hospices took part of the evaluation. However, I just want to say that a lot more people attended this program, but only 145 took part in the evaluation. So from the 145 participants, the majority were nurses, around 39.3%, um, followed by counselors. Uh, in terms of age groups, the majority were in the range of 50 to 59 years of age, followed by 40 to 49. Uh, in terms of um, sexual orientation, the majority identified as heterosexual, 97.2%, and the majority identified as Caucasian or white British, and the majority identified as female, which was kind of major limitation because we didn't have much of a diverse group. Um, in terms of, uh, there, there was a significant, a very significant increase in the knowledge of general LGBT issues and needs in the people who attended uh, after the session, and also a significant increase uh, in the knowledge of LGBT issues and needs in palliative and end-of-life care in the post-session cohort. In terms of, there was, we didn't find any relation or association between age group 
and the level of knowledge in, the, in, the pe in people before they attended the session. However, there was an association in terms of the younger the age group, the more likely that they, the more they became knowledgeable after the session. Also, there was very significant increase in the confidence in providing palliative and end-of-life care for LGBT people uh, after attending the session. And also, there was significant increase in comfort with using terms related to gender and sexual minorities. And surprisingly, actually, uh, people who aged 60 and over were, were more comfortable than younger people, uh, the younger age groups, which was interesting. In terms of quality of training, the majority said that the training uh, was excellent and around 20% that it was good. And the majority felt that they would be interested in further training in this area. And 100% of the participants said that this training, uh, found that this training is, is very useful for uh, their practice. So um, how we are building on and anchoring this change. So at St. Francis Hospice at the moment, this was, fa this, this was phase one. Now we moved on to phase two. Phase two is what we are doing is we're trying to embed this training in our organization. So we are looking at making it part of the mandatory training for all existing and new staff. We are also, phase two involves looking at the physical environment. We're looking at the documentation, our documentation, the language used in the documentation, and also we are reviewing our assessment process and making sure that sexuality is more explicit and gender identity in our assessment process. And we're also looking at putting mechanisms in place to collect data about sexuality and gender identity. Um, and also we are looking, as I said, about the, we're looking to make changes to the physical environment to make it more LGBT affirmative. And I always, you know, um, one of the main things about, the main challenges is about when talking about collecting data or um, related to, to sexuality and gender identity. And it's a recurring theme that I hear from staff and just people in general that, you know, it's very intrusive, it's very private. Um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable in doing that. But I always say, you know, in palliative care, we do ask a lot of very intrusive questions. I mean, we ask people about their bowel motion. We ask them to describe their stool. How come this is not, you know, very intrusive and private? Um, but, but we do it because, and we feel confident doing it, because we acknowledge that this is important to do. Um, in terms of, we also created an interactive online version of this training for ELCA, which is available to all NHS and hospice staff, free of charge. And this training program has also become embedded as a core element in the undergraduate and postgraduate palliative and end-of-life care curricula at London South Bank University. We've also done some international work, so this training program has been adapted and piloted in Lebanon at the uh, BALSAM, which is the Lebanese Center for Palliative Care, and the, the pilot was very positive. So now it's been adopted by the Lebanese Medical Association for Sexual Health, and it has become part of the annual National LGBT Health Week in Lebanon. And now we're doing some, also we're starting to do some work with countries in the Middle East and North Africa re region like Tunis and Qatar, where they are interested in uh, adapting this training and start piloting it in their own country. Thank you so much. Are we on? We're on. Lovely. Um, I've just stepped down here because the lights are really blinding and a few of my colleagues have said it's really hard to see when people are asking questions, so that's all that's about. Um, I'd very much like to thank our speaker, speakers for some amazing talks um, and to Kimberly as well. I'd like to open the floor now for questions and discussion. Who'd like to kick us off? You know you want to. Over the back there, Rowena, if you would. Thank you very much. Hi. I'm Mark Stodden from North London Hospice. I just want to um, make a, a or I suppose it's a question or a comment or a thought um, about um, the role of trauma um, and that 
um, the experience of being gay or LGBT probably is about a series of trauma throughout life and that actually the trauma of illness um, of end of life is another another trauma so the context of um, of a of a group of people who have been serially traumatized throughout life um, I, I don't think um, I, I, I'm gay myself I um, I'm involved in supportive care or psychosocial support in um, our hospice. Um, I don't think that hospices are very good at actually using the language of trauma in considering what they deal with. Um, and that therefore I do question how predisposed hospices really are to sort of getting into that area or that reflection in relation to the LGBT group. Um, I think things, trauma and anxiety is managed very much through sort of pathways in the medical model and not through kind of consideration about actual anxiety generated within people. So I think that's one thing. And then in a way on the other side of that is a sort of like a paradox of the experience of the pimp. I think very often people quote quite dramatic experiences and I've had them myself, every gay person has. Um, in their life around healthcare and everything else, and with friends who are dying, etc. Um, but actually, sometimes it's not about the dramatic things or the overt prejudice or the ignorance. It's the, the continual pinpricks of experience of difference. Um, and I think that the, the the guy who kind of cried when he when he saw the rainbow flag, it's just like a sort of relief about not having another pinprick, as opposed to something overt, like you know like a discriminatory comment. So I just think we need to go deeper um, into, the, into the dialogue. I th that's what I would, be, I would be saying. I also want to say, and this is a bit of an inflammatory thing to say, we've had representation from my hospice um, at the London network, and none of the information has come back into our hospice. So I think there's something about the, the kind of the power of an individual and about how they actually can bring back messages and the confidence with which they can do it and the, the emotional risk that they take to do it is really significant. Thank you very much. Could I perhaps ask Dallas and Claude to um, reflect on those comments? Yeah, does a, can, is that working? Yes. You know, firstly, Mark. Humble apologies that you haven't heard anything back from the network. Um, I obviously know who your representative is, so I'll, I'll see what's, what's happening there, but uh, maybe we'll take it offline rather than me tell you uh, what I might think uh, over here. I think, I think you're right about the use of the word trauma. I think, we tend to, I think we tend to talk about a series of challenges, a series of experiences, a series of anxiety-provoking um, you know, experiences within healthcare rather than using the word trauma. Um, I honestly don't know, sat here, whether I think trauma is, is a word that we might use, but I think your point is very, very well made, that actually when you get to a point in your life and you need end-of-life care on a series of traumas, it may be just one, one too many, and you do need to acknowledge where you've been in life to get you to that point and where you need that support. Um, so I think it's, it's a really good point. I've never, I have to say, I've never thought of using the word trauma. So thanks for that. I have really nothing to add except for, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you've said it all. <laughs> uh, but it, it, is, it is something, yes, that we probably need to think about. And, you know, the use of the term trauma, it's something that, yes, as well, it's not something mm commonly used in at least in our hospice setting. So no, thank you for highlighting this. Kimberly, I noticed you nodding there. Was there anything you'd like yeah. to add? Well, I was just thinking it is an opportunity for us um, to look at having conversations around trauma-informed care beyond just LGBTQ, um, because it's certainly something I'm hearing in the States that we need to train hospice and palliative care providers more about, in general, providing trauma-informed care. And L the traumas experienced by LGBTQ people are one kind of trauma, but there are lots of other kinds of traumas as well that we could certainly do a better job of being um, 
understanding and sensitive view. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> hello. Um, I'm Tricia Wilcox. I'm from Eleanor uh, Hospice. Um, thank you for your really interesting um, conversations and, and, and talks to us. Um, I'm struck by one thing that was mentioned earlier today about the pace of change, and the pace of change has never been as fast as it is now, and the pace of change is going faster as we move on. Um, I want to perhaps ask a question. Um, there has been a huge pace of change for LBGT issues um, in society generally, and I'll share one example of that. Um, I belong to um, a faith group, and in our faith group, um, we were at our conference in the summer, and we had a discussion about LBGT, and we relayed that to some of our young people who weren't there. They were outraged that we had to even discuss it, because in their minds, it's mainstream. There is so much awareness there is such a wider understanding. Now, please don't let me... I'm not taking away the needs of, of different groups, but I am wondering whether um, we think we might be compartmentalising people um, and labelling people um, unnecessarily because the needs of LBGT people themselves are so diverse if you layer on top of LBGT cultural issues, um, family issues, and the, all the intersectionality that goes on <coughs> in society, uh, and I hear about the needs for training and we need to raise awareness, I suppose my, my, my gut is telling me one size does not fit all and that we just need to be... I, I'm so proud that as hospices we um, treat people as individuals. <laughs> And I think that's got to be one of our strengths. And yes, we've got to have the debate, but I, I just, I, I feel myself being overtaken by the younger generation who are coming along that really have embraced this in society and are really comfortable with it. And so perhaps it's an age generational thing. Sorry, that's lots of thoughts I've thrown at you. Hmm. May I respond? Of course, thank you. Um, so I think your, your comments are well taken. Um, there has been a lot of societal progress in terms of uh, inclusion and acceptance of LGBTQ people. It's something I hear in the United States a lot, uh, comments similar to yours when I present, um, because people say things have come so far. But in the United States, just as an example, it is still completely legal to fire me from a job just because I'm a lesbian in 29 states. And people don't realize that the impact of that kind of discrimination on people's willingness to seek out care and comfort in seeking out care, when just your identity as an LGBTQ person could cost you employment, um, but it's legal to evict people from apartments for being gay or transgender in 29 states in the U.S. And so... Um, I'm not saying in any way that the United Kingdom is as far behind socially as the United States, but there are still the people who live in the UK have lived through discrimination that they carry with them. So even though the attitudes of young people are, are changing, when you have a 70-year-old person seeking hospice care, they have lived through and even present day have the experience of knowing their life could be in jeopardy because of who they are, um, because of violence, because of hate crimes, because of discrimination. And so when they come to you, they come carrying this, it's like a duffel bag of trauma that they bring with them. So while attitudes are changing, the lived experiences of the people you serve um, continue to have that, um, you know, the kind of echoes of the past that they bring with them. And that's why I think it is so important that we talk about LGBTQ people, specifically when we talk about end-of-life care. That's just my perspective um, as, as someone who both does this work, but also as a lesbian who I know attitudes have changed significantly. I know my son, he's 19, his attitudes and the attitudes of his generation are so much more progressive than those of mine 
But when I need care, there are going to be people of my son's generation, but also people of my generation taking care of me. And so we have to get everyone caught up. Thank you, Kimberly. Catherine, could I invite you to respond? Thank you very much. Um, so thanks for the, for the question. It's really great to open some discussion. I guess the first thing I would say is, um, is that uh, we've been fortunate in the UK to have a raft of legislative change. Um, legislative, I can never say that word, legal change is one thing. Societal change is, is quite another. Um, another point I would make is that um, for individuals, uh, Kimberly talked about someone in their 70s, um, for individuals as young as in their 40s, they may have lived through a time when their relationship was illegal uh, and experienced that, that barrage of trauma throughout their life. But importantly, we also need to think about the diversity of our communities. There are at least five countries across the globe where it's still legal for people to face the death penalty uh, for gay relationships. And so people's very recent past may be very, very different. But you do raise a really important point around intersectionality. What we cannot do is, is have a LGBT box that we get out when somebody comes through our doors. It's about recognising that sexual orientation and gender identity are facets of somebody's identity. And of course, how do we support them in relation to their other protected characteristics as well? There were a number of people I interviewed who had a faith and who wanted uh, care that would support them both in terms of their faith as well as their sexual orientation. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your question. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Of course, two people put their hands up when you say that. We'll take both those questions. If we could take them one after the other, that would be great. Dr. Sarah Bell, um, Medical Director at Garden House Hospice Care. Um, I just wanted to share um, an experience that actually I presented and Catherine's heard before at another conference I attended. Um, and it's from a couple of years ago. We had a man and his wife come to our daycare and I was seeing him for chronic pain. He had a life-limiting condition, but I was seeing him for chronic pain as an outpatient and tried a number of measures and my gut instinct was that there was something else going on underneath. And as we got to know him, it turned out that uh, he opened up that he uh, identified as a woman um, and his wife had supported him in this for a number of years and that behind closed doors he had a very uh, complex and labour intensive way of, of preparing himself to go out in public as a woman. Um, and long and complicated story short, we helped him to come to our day centre as, the, as his his ego as a woman, um, his identity as a woman, and his wife came too, and we in, I introduced them both to our uh, group, um, and they were very well accepted. We got him psychological support. He started to uh, seek uh, further medical support that we couldn't provide as palliative care. And actually what was really interesting was as that happened, his pain got exponentially better. Um, mm. Sadly, at the end of the day, he felt it was too complicated and he went back to living as a man. Um, but the experience of just being supported and listened for the first time in his life by healthcare professionals and able to express his true identity was so powerful in managing his symptoms um, and allowing him to be seen as who he truly was. Thank you. And the gentleman just a couple of rows ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Damien McMahon. I'm a palliative care consultant in uh, Northern Ireland in um, a hospice there. So um, I apologise, first of all, for, for uh, missing a good part of this session. Um, um, but I'm really glad that there has been a session and to have picked up on some of what has been discussed. I think that um, there were some very interesting comments around trauma and I think that um, I just reiterating that um, I suppose uh, in the Republic of Ireland there was obviously our there was the, the equal marriage referendum um, a, a few years ago and whilst personally I was never keen on the idea of there being a referendum for this um, actually a lot the narrative around that uh, that came out um, and the trauma that that people had experienced growing up 
um, living uh, w with with these issues and with discrimination and were significant. And I think that that getting that dialogue, um, having having the conversation, there were so many conversations happening on the over the kitchen table that I think were were, were really useful. And I think that I welcome the 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 progression that there has been, particularly in the younger generation. And and that this isn't an issue. And that why are we talking about this? This is fine. But I think I just would reiterate the the need for. Uh, us to avoid complacency as well uh, because discrimination is very real and, and, and I think there's some pockets of the UK where things are difficult and I'm maybe from one of them. <laughs> um, I think that there's certainly been a lot of progression in Northern Ireland as well but, but I think that it's important that we're not complacent and I suppose within our own hospice um, I think that it's important that we're not complacent uh, thinking that oh, we're fine, you know, that, that we are, we're, we're very comfortable and that we, we, we obviously welcome um, LG BT people, but I think we have to think about how we, without having a box, I think that's a very good way of uh, describing it, how we actually, um, you know, um, convey our support and, and having the conversation and not being afraid to ask um, about sexual orientation um, as part of our assessment so that we're actually being truly holistic in our approach. And I think that's really important and I think I'd be interested maybe chatting with some of you at some stage just about how we, you know, as a local hospice can uh, do that. We've, we've tried to have a presence in our local pride period and have a rainbow symbol, but I'm sure there's a lot more that we could do and um, I apologize for missing <laughs> the, the, the sort of it, but thank you for, for, for putting together this session. So. Thank you. Would any of the panel like to make some quick final comments in response? I'd, I'd just like to thank you all for being here, quite frankly, because you've got to go and eat in a minute, haven't you? That must be much more appealing. But I think, for me, all of this comes down to being authentic. It's about us as organisations being authentic with the people that we serve and being open and honest about who we are and what we want to do. It's about allowing the people that we serve to be authentic and be their real selves so that they can cope with what's happening to them in their, in their, in their very best way they can. And it's about allowing our staff to be authentic as well. We all want our staff to come to work being the very best version of themselves that they can be. Um, for me, that includes us allowing them, you know, to identify in any which way that they want to do when they come to work. So for me, this is all about authenticity and however you want to label that. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, before we leave, if we could just um, offer the panel um, our thanks for their contribution. Thank you.